Good afternoon and welcome uh, to this Falling Walls session on scientific credibility in a post-pandemic world. My name is Max Vogler and I'm Vice President for Global Strategic Networks at Elsevier. And before we get started, I want to especially thank Wissenschaft im Dialog for partnering with us on this session and also the Falling Walls Foundation for including us in this wonderful program today. I really like this workshop format. So let's begin. At this point, it's a cliche to say that the past 18 months have changed the world. But we wouldn't be academics if we didn't ask what changed. How did it change? For whom did it change? And so on and so forth. This panel, we will ask those questions. And I think most of you who saw the plenary panels this morning saw that both trust in science, engagement with science, science communication came up repeatedly. Um, that credibility and science are two very important subjects that we want to reflect on as an academic community. Um, we've divided the session into two parts. We will begin with an impulse presentation by Ricarda Ziegler, who will cover some definitions and a current analysis on the topics. And then we'll move to a panel discussion, and I'll introduce the panelists then. But first, Ricarda. Ricarda Ziegler is project lead at Wissenschaft im Dialog, where she's responsible for the Wissenschaftsbarometer, which is an annual survey on science and research and Impact Unit, which is a project that aims to develop a more meaningful evaluation practice and a stronger impact orientation for science communication measures. Ricarda studied, studied political science at the FU Berlin and at the University of Sussex. Ricarda, over to you. Thanks very much, um, Max, and also for the opportunity today to share um, some of our data and to give a short impulse at the beginning of the session on questions of confidence um, and trust in science and research. Um, and I think the title of the session um, already includes two terms, confidence and credibility. And I think also questions of trust, of trustworthiness, have um, influenced discussions around science communication in the last one and a half years. Um, and this leads me to the first question um, for this session. Why does trust in science and research, in scientists, in their results and their insights actually matter? And um, the literature on science of science communication actually gives quite a clear answer to that. It says that on the one hand, trust in science is important within science so that researchers can trust in the work of other researchers in what they are publishing and their shared methods, standard procedures and mechanisms like peer review to ensure that researchers can actually trust um, the work of others. And on the other hand, we also see that trust in science is important outside the scientific system, outside academia, so that the publics and societies can actually benefit from science and from new research insights without actually fully understanding. So we all can use an elevator, enter a plane, or get vaccinated without in detail understanding what's actually happening there because we are trusting in science and researchers. And one way to assess the level of public trust in science and research is to look at representative public opinion surveys on science attitudes of people. And there are a couple of those available um, for different countries, produced by different organizations, by different stakeholders, by different market research firms. But they generally show for many Western countries, for many countries in the industrialized world, so to say, that we have generally high levels of public trust in science and research in those countries or in many countries. And we also see that in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic in the last one and a half years, those levels have rather increased or the levels of kind of like skepticism has decreased in many contexts in the context of COVID. And we also see that in our own data, in the data we gather for Germany with the science barometer, with currently 60% of people in Germany stating to somewhat or completely trust in science and research. Um, and these numbers are currently a bit lower than they were in spring 2020, so to say in the beginning of the pandemic or in the first phase, um, but they are still higher than numbers in previous years like 2017, 18, 19. Um, so numbers are still higher than um, pre-COVID. And we also say it's interesting that kind of like a rather small number of people states to kind of like rather distrust or completely distrust science and research. And I think for all, for us, it's 
also quite interesting to look at a right um, at a quite interesting share of people being undecided of those questions, which also changed within the COVID-19 context. And I think if we look at those high these high levels of um, trust in science and research are not too surprising if we look at the characteristics um, people use to describe scientists. And this is um, data which was just um, published a couple of weeks ago. It's new Eurobarometer data um, relevant for the EU 27 countries gathered in 2021. And we see here that people think of scientists as not only being intelligent, but also as being reliable and as being honest, which we know are dimensions of trust. So I trust someone to be honest. Um, I trust that someone is um, doing reliable work. And I think it's also quite interesting to see that we have a uh, below 50% of respondents in those surveys to state that they think um, scientists know what is good or what is best for people. Um, so we see that quite some people are doubting questions of the benevolence of scientists and of researchers and of them being oriented towards questions of public interest. And we also see something along those lines in our own data. Again, here for Germany, we ask for agreement with different reasons for distrusting scientists. And we see here here that usually, and even though to a bit lesser extent in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, most people agree that it's the dependency on funders um, of research, which are a reason for them for actually distrusting in science and research. And if we have this a bit in the back of our head um, and now turn a bit around the perspective to see what do scientists themselves actually think about those numbers? Um, do they think these high levels um, of trust are good? Do they kind of like um, have the same perception here? And luckily there is also <laughs> survey data available uh, for that. So this time it's the other way around. We didn't ask the public um, about science and research, but um, researchers um, in Germany, what they think about questions of public trust and understanding. And we see here um, with data which was gathered at the end of 2020 for researchers in Germany um, that a majority agrees that the reputation of science has improved, um, the reputation in society has improved in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and they're not so sure about the public understanding if this increased in will, but kind of like this high levels of trust are also perceived within um, science and among researchers. Um, and then even, oh, sorry. And an even larger um, share agrees also that public expectations have increased in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we see that there is a public need and public expectation for scientists who are highly trusted to help fight or to help end this pandemic quickly. And in order to do so, they have also changed some things within science and research. And I think one thing that has changed um, is that preprints um, have become much more popular, which we see here according to a 2021 Elsevier survey conducted by Ipsos Murray. And they show here that compared to 2020, more research, more international researchers in this case, um, value preprints as a valued source of communication. And I think this brings me to my conclusion um, for my short impulse talk here, which I hope will kickstart the following discussion um, that we see in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, a change in public perception of science and research, that we also kind of like see changes within science and research, also trying to kind of like adapt to those needs and expectations um, for actually fighting the pandemic. And I think these questions of, for example, preprints um, being much more important also offers questions of when they come publicly available how communication takes within science and research and how this also is perceived outside and how this might like these questions and um, might influence trust and what kind of like are the challenges therefore for the science communication here thanks very much thank you Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricarda, for that excellent introduction on this topic. And now I would like to introduce three wonderful colleagues who will discuss this subject with me, with all of us together here. First, to my left is Jean Rubner, who heads the editorial department Wissen und Bildung Aktuell, so Research and Education, Current Events in, at the Bayerische Rundfunk, which is a branch of German public broadcasting. She is responsible for several TV and radio shows as well as online formats, and she also teaches science communication at the Technical University of Munich, where she has graduated with a PhD in physics. 
Um, before joining the Bayerische Rundfunk, she was an editor at the Süddeutsche and has also written a number of books on um, top topics such as brain research, energy politics, education politics, and politics in general. Thank you for being here, Jean. Thank you. Next to Jean, we have Markus Weiskopf, who has been managing director of Wissenschaft in Dialog, which is Science and Dialogue, since 2012. In that time, he's developed many formats, such as Science Slams, the Wissenschaftsbarometer that Ricardo works on, and many other formats to help science communication as a discipline and as a practice emerge and develop in Germany. He studied politics and management in Konstanz in Madrid and was instrumental in setting up the House of Wissenschaft, so the House of Science in Braunschweig, before coming to Berlin to be the, uh, to be the managing director of VED here. Welcome, Marcus. Thanks, Max. And last, but certainly not least, we have Sabine Kleinert, who is senior executive editor at The Lancet with responsibles, responsibilities for research integrity, publication ethics, and open access policies. In 2018, she initiated preprints with The Lancet in partnership with SSRN, which was one of the first medical preprint offerings. She serves as vice chair of the Committee on Publication Ethics and also on the World Conferences on Research Integrity Found Foundation, and she's co-chair of the seventh World Conference on Research, Research Integrity, which will be held in Cape Town, South Africa next year. Welcome, Sabina. Thank you very much. So let's start with the basics. From your vantage point as a journal editor, as a science communicator, and as a science journalist, what makes science credible to you in your everyday work? What do you look for? And what makes you question something that you see? So, Jean, let's start with you. <laughs> well, of course, we always want a good story. That's a, it's a story that matters to people, that touches them emotionally. So that's that's a, you know essential. Um, I would say, what are we looking for? I mean, we, we certainly, as science journalists, are part of the system of scientific publications and peer-reviewed scientific publications. We think we trust the system, even though we know it's not always working well. It has its flaws, but it's probably the best system uh, we, uh, we have right now. We would probably, if I had a new study that I would think about, is it a story? Is it worth a story? I would look at the statistics, of course. Is, you know, are there enough, you know, like if it's a medical thing, you know how many uh, people have participated to the study. I would also look, I must say, at the reputation of the scientists who conducted the work. Um, I would maybe question something when an institution pushes it too much. Yeah. So if there's a too much of a publicity from the side of the institution, um, I might question, you know, why do they do that? Is it really that important? And, you know, most of all, always, how does it fit to, into the context of, you know, research that has already been done? I mean, is it, is, are there explanations behind who the model, are there models that fit the data? So we kind of do a little analysis and that's, that's a, brings us to decisions. Is it a good story? Do we want to pick it up or not? Perfect, thank you, Jean. Let's move on to Marcus, who's one of the people that thinks about how to push the information out there. <laughs> Sorry, Marcus. Marcus. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's more or less the same for us. I mean, if you're looking for experts for our science communication formats, it's, it's more or less the same that we're looking for. But, I mean, we do look for experts who are trustworthy. We look at the, at the people, but we also look at the institutions. Are they trustworthy? Are they, uh, do they have a reputation for a certain field? Um, well, we also look on the methods, on the statistics to, to uh, uh, um, estimate if a certain study, for example, uh, is good. Um, um, we look at the people who did already publish in the same field, for example, so that's what we also do. And we look for transparency, maybe that's one thing to add. Uh, do people really actively communicate about the financing of, uh, of their research, about potential conflicts of interest? Um, about um, maybe, well, is there some animal testing done in, in this uh, research and are they really transparent about those things? So that's what I would look for. And uh, so that it, because this is really important for, for us as science communicators that those people we put in front, we, we put actively on panels, for example, with 
the, uh, the people out there that we, they are really trustworthy. Thank you. Sabine, your look is a little bit earlier in the process, before the articles get published. How do you look at the subject? Yes, I think two of the key issues have already been mentioned, which is very interesting, transparency and research and context. So when a paper lands on my, in my inbox or on my desk, um, I look at two perspectives in particular, and that is transparency and honesty. So transparency in terms of how was the research planned? Why was it planned? How was it conducted? How were the methods uh, decided on? And what happened along the way? And this is where the honesty comes in as well, um, because research doesn't always go by plan. So if something goes wrong, I want to be told this. And we, we, we actually find out ourselves if the authors haven't told us, because we look at, for example, at protocols of trials and see what has been planned. And if they had stated a particular sample size, but they didn't reach it and they don't mention it, then I'm sort of getting slightly suspicious already. Um, then honesty also in terms of what does this research now mean? Um, what are the, its limitations? So I often go to the discussion section first and see if authors have actually recognized what the limitations of this research are. And if authors have very honestly also commented on the generalizability. So a trial that's only done in old white men is not generalizable to women or children or to people you know, from low middle income countries. And that needs to be mentioned somewhere in the paper. So these are all sort of little flags that I look for. However, I, I also want to say that these are the things that we can help authors with. So we can make authors report you know, transparently, report honestly. Um, Often we get a paper which is actually negative for its primary outcome, but the authors make a lot of their secondary outcomes or of post hoc analysis. And if we think it's an important negative finding, a null finding, we still go with it, but we make them report it honestly and accordingly. And I think that's a good role of an editor. And this is where we can actually truly add value along the way, because this could be you know, publish as a preprint with the wrong interpretation, not wrong, but a not a very scientific interpretation, um, and people then take the wrong message away from that. So these are the things. Lastly, I would like to say the word trust has also been mentioned a lot this morning and today, mm -hmm. and trust, and I want to say this in a slightly different way. So as editors, we operate on a level of trust between authors and editors. You know, you said, trustworthy institutions. I would actually just say, I take what authors tell me on trust. If they lie to me, if later on it's been found out to be falsified, fabricated, you know, I have still taken it on trust. It's not my role um, to go and look at the, you know, source data, to, to, to be mistrustful of anything the authors tell me. And this is what's often misunderstood when we retract a paper, you know, because this kind of falsification is not often di discovered by peer review. It's, if it's done well and reported, you know, sense, I mean, credibly, I should say, then, you know, it, we can't discover it easily. Um, we try to, but it's not easy. So I think this operating on trust, that we believe what authors tell us, but we look for little signs, you know, where we can improve the paper, or for what we would call red flags. If, for example, and that's sometimes peer reviewers might point out to us, a result looks too good to be true. That's when the little red alarm bells ring in our heads and we look very carefully then, you know, what does that mean? And then we take the appropriate steps. So I think, Marcus, you wanted to follow up with the comment? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's mostly the same uh, with a relationship between press officers and, and the scientists in the university or research organization. It's based on trust. And I think also press officers, we have at one side actively uh, have to ask uh, the scientists for those information about well, financing, for example, about the methods and about limitations and so on. And on the other side, they have to help them with uh, well, support and frameworks to, but they, so that they can provide this information on a, well, on a good level. Okay, so let's talk about COVID. 
During the pandemic, science has been there through the lows of changing recommendations on masks to the highs of vaccine development. So I think we've seen it all sort of as a scientific community over the past 18 months. Can I ask you to reflect a little bit on what has changed in terms of how you perceive credibility of authors, of papers, of scientific outputs in the most general sense? Maybe we'll start with Sabine and work our way the other way. Okay, thanks. Uh, I might give you a little bit of background. So what happened to us in the COVID pandemic at a journal? Because I think that's important to understand. So, you know, at the Lancet and the Lancet journals, we would have got four to six times the number of submissions in that period than we normally do. And for the Lancet Weekly, that would mean instead of 20 papers a day, we would get between 80 and 100. And, you know, we had to scrutinize all these papers internally. We have a big staff of editors, and we managed to do this, but it was very hard work. Um, what's also changed is authors wanted to get out their results really, really quickly, as quickly as possible. And we were quite well placed to do that because we have a fast track system anyway, whereby randomized controlled trials or research with high um, public health importance can get out within uh, four weeks of submission and go through the normal, same rigorous peer review process than any other papers. There would be three clinical reviewers and a statistical reviewer, and in, in terms of COVID, sometimes a modeler as well, depending on the paper or an economist. So we did that throughout the pandemic. I think in terms of what has changed what you mentioned about, you know, the COVID vaccines were clearly an unprecedented success. You know, getting a vaccine developed and, a, and, a, and an efficient and safe vaccine developed in under a year is unheard of. Everybody agrees on that. What is different is with the masks, for example, is that alongside evidence that is not like a trial, you know, a trial is quite a, it, it's, it's, the most important evidence, but mask wearing, you can't do a trial of mask wearing in the same sort of way. So there are all sorts of other factors around it. So it's different type of research. And when this was summarized finally in June 2020, it came out on a, on a positive effect of mask wearing, but on a very low level of uh, evidence, of grade of evidence. So, you know, that's to be understood. And the other thing is that what happened at the time was that policy had to be developed alongside accumulating research, you know, which is different to uh, other times, you know, whereas we wait until enough research has accumulated and then make a policy change. For COVID, that wasn't, that wasn't possible. So I think, you know, this is where it's important also for everyone, and I include the public, to understand the different types of research. You know, what is a trial? What is an observational study? What is just an association study, which is only hypothesis generating, you know, and not very strong and firm evidence? So these are my, is my answer to that. But okay. I'm happy to carry on later. I think we'll talk a little bit more about COVID. Marcos, do you want to go next? Um, yes, maybe to add on this, uh, yeah, we all did a sort of crash course on, on science and research on processes and how science works. And <clears throat> I mean, well, people were listening for hours and hours to, to Trosten talking about his methods and really in depth uh, how, how this, uh, this is working. And we never imagined that this could be possible in science communication. I, I mean, I always told that we should not underestimate um, the public and our audiences. But that's what we always do, and we still keep doing it. Uh, so maybe this is uh, now the time to change this, uh, this attitude towards our audiences. Uh, so, but I think that's, that was a um, real important development during the pandemic, because I mean, what Ricarda just showed, um, that uh, integrity and benevolence is really important for trust in, in science, so that uh, perceived integrity and benevolence. And I think if you can only really perceive it while seeing the process, the people behind science, and not only the results uh, science is uh, uh, providing. Yeah, and Jean, as a 
science journalist. I mean, for many years we've talked about the fact, oh, science journalism is becoming less important, we want to make it more important. Mm. Now came COVID. <laughs> so how did you work with science? What changed for your everyday life? And on the credibility, like how do you begin to look at the results and think about that? Yeah, um, to be honest, I mean, I think as science journalism already picked up before COVID because it's a great topic for, for the web. I mean, we see a lot of people interested. I mean, web users are more interested in science than, than other traditional media um, users. So we've already seen a build up of, uh, at least uh, at my company, um, of science reporting. And then COVID, of course, accelerated that. So we've seen an incredible, um, incredible speed. We've seen an incredible amount of uh, of uh, stories. Um, we've we had to tackle, of course, with all that preprint business. You know, how do we as journalists um, work with preprints? And um, I think I what I learned is like, or what what came out for me. I, it, it we made I think a lot of progress in the way we. We um, reported on science, not only the results, but also, you know, this is the way science works. And these are the limitations of science. I mean, we had the debate in Germany uh, that if those of you who live here know that, that we have different uh, well-known virologists who took different stances on, on how to tackle the epidemic. And, and I think it, it came out clear that you know, it's uh, there is no one you know like one voice in science, and then there is no one interpretation of data, but uh, or one truth. But there are you know several ways to interpret data and so on. So what I hope is that that we made it clearer. You know, science works this and that way. I think I I would I would criticize ourselves as science journalists that we not often enough speak about. That you know, we also we're kind of in this uh, uh, too often in this science uh, observing business and science telling business, and we kind of understand ourselves, you know, like eh, we just uh, we just tell the people what's happening in the labs. No, we also have to to talk about the fact how is how does uh, science how does it work? How do scientists work? How do different results occur? Why are there different you know interpretations? And uh, I, I see that more than before as our job, as you know, independent, more independent observers, I would say, uh, than maybe before COVID-19. I mean, I think one of the challenges of, of, of science going out into the world is the provisional nature of results. You know, we're relatively certain that we might be certain that something could happen, but we know something else is going to come up, and then maybe it'll change the way we think about something. When we talk about science communication, we usually talk, whether it's journalism or anything else, about getting the science out there. How much do we also need to get the scientific process out there? Who wants to yeah, reflect I, on that? Yeah, more than, more than before. <laughs> and I would, I would like to appeal to the scientists themselves that have to, you know, that they have to talk more about that and make it more transparent. Uh, can I just, yeah, I just want to respond to that because it's really, really important. And I, I see that very much also as our job, you know, at a journal, because we, we have seen people reading The Lancet who probably never read The Lancet in their life before in the last year or two. <laughs> and, you know, and, it's, and we assumed wrongly, you know, obviously, that everybody understands what kind of paper each paper is. You know, what is the difference between a comment and a viewpoint? What is the difference between research and a correspondence letter? What's the difference between a review and a systematic review? So, you know, we all knew that ourselves, our regular readers all knew that. But why should the public know that, you know? And so we embarked on explaining what these different papers are and what they mean, how they come to be. Some of these are not peer reviewed. You know, correspondence is a letter to the editor, which is scientific debate. Um, it's not peer reviewed. It's the opinion of the author who writes in. And sometimes, you know, the author that they comment on, the paper they comment on will write a reply. So it's a scientific debate. But people often took that as 
this is now what the journal thinks and what is a fact, whereas it's part of the debate. So we produced some information on our website, you know, for the public, aimed at the public, on what all these papers are, what they mean, which ones are peer-reviewed, which ones aren't. And I think that's a whole way already talking about the process and how to arrive at certain evidence or certain pieces of work. Marcus? Yeah, I mean, we have, we have to think about how can we include this into the different formats of uh, science communication, into science journalism. I mean, it would be really good if science journalists really ask for, for those things as well. I mean, not only having in mind, okay, I have to tell the story of a process, but also I have, I have to talk about limitations. I, I remember there has been a, a box on, on this uh, under every um, article about a new, uh, new studies at Spiegel Online a few years ago about limitation, about methods, and so on. I think we need those boxes again, maybe, and we need those boxes already under press releases from universities, so that this is really transparent. And when, when there are different formats we can use as well for uh, communicating about the process, about the methods, I mean, citizen science, for example, is, is one way to really include people in the research process so that they can really see what is happening there. Uh, but there are also other formats. I mean, one goal of a science slam, for example, is also that young researchers tell the people how they did their research on their thesis. So, yeah. so we've now talked a lot about communication of science with the public. We also want to spend a little bit of time talking about scientists communicating with each other. What have you seen? I mean, one of the things, at least in Germany, we saw with the Leopoldina commissions, the other thing, there was much more of a focus on interdisciplinarity, that one discipline can't solve the problem itself. Has that filtered into the way that, for example, you as a journalist have, have tried to think about stories not just as coming out of microbiology or not just coming out of physics, but really more that it's society has a problem that it's trying to solve and it needs to bring lots of different disciplines and scientific knowledge into it, that it's your job then to figure out how that works? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a big, uh, big challenge. No, but I mean, of course, it, I think we were all, when I, when I reflect our role in the pandemic, I mean, we were all, of course, at the beginning, you know, only writing about virology papers and preprints and, and uh, you know, like how the virus is transmitted. I think we forgot a little bit about, you know, all the other things uh, that were happening, what, you know, the consequences of the lockdowns, you know, mostly for children and so on. And, and slowly we discovered we should ask a few <laughs> psychologists out there and, and educational specialists and so on. Um, so I would say, of course, this, this is certainly a role that we as science journalists, as you know, I like to stress, we, we should be more the independent observers of science. Um, we should do that. But I also would wish that the scientists themselves would communicate in another way uh, with each other. And I think this, I sometimes feel that this, this you know, like, um, way of interacting. I, one scientist, you know, would, would very rarely criticize a, a, a immediate colleague, right? You know, that, uh, so I miss a little bit sometimes this, this discussion within science, you know, a, a cultivated discussion about, you know, the methods, the outcomes, the interpretation of data, and so on. So um, I don't know, Sabine, if, you, if that's something you, you, you're the closest to, to the scientists but uh, that's something I would wish for. Yes, I, I agree with that. And you know, we've tried, it's difficult because they're not used to work to, with each other. Social scientists are not used to work with virologists or modelers, you know, but I think they need to. I totally agree. How to best do that is a, is a different question. You know, we have tried to commission particular comments on papers that come from a different angle on, for example, school closures. You know, we would have educationists talking about that in an accompanying comment to a research paper. So that's what we can do in the immediate way. Um, what we also do, but that is a long, is always a long-term project, it's a sort of three-year thing, is where we take one big topic, you know, um, for example, you know, 
diagnostics. We have not enough diagnostics in the world, you know, and we have we have not um, talked about this in all the discussion on universal health coverage. Yet, in the COVID pandemic, suddenly, you know, we had all these diagnostics, home testing, it was suddenly possible. So how can we harness this for, you know, universal health coverage globally. So we have actually very fortuitously worked on a diagnostics commission for three years, which has just come out in October, who then could take that on, that aspect. But for these commissions, my point was that for these commissions, we deliberately bring 35 people or so together who never work together, you know, and there could be also patient representatives, it could be psychologists, it could be economists, it could be you know, basic scientists versus clinical scientists. And it's a very interesting process if you're in a room, with, and now we're on Zoom, but if you're in a room <laughs> with them, you know, and discuss, um, they come with very, very different experience, very different expectations, and they kind of work together. The end result is really exciting sometimes when it works. But let me ask also Marcus and put him on the spot for a second. Science and dialogue, of course, is not just about science and dialogue with society, but also science and dialogue with itself. How has the understanding shifted at all within the past 18 months of what Wissenschaft im Dialog, also science and dialogue, is supposed to do? Do you have programs or are you thinking about programs where it's scientists talking to each other or is it really just about the public engagement? I think it's about public engagement and <laughs> I think that's a lot to do uh, already so and uh, so we, st we stick with that so I mean I have some reflections on, on uh, scientists talking to each other and, uh, and I think uh, yeah I mean we could elaborate on, on, on that and maybe we can learn from science communication formats of how to do best uh, and, and of how to maybe pimp their uh, conferences sometimes a bit but uh, uh, I think uh, I'll stick with mine. Yeah. Okay, so I have one more question that I'll open it up to the, um, to the audience here as well. So we're all here as individuals, but we also represent various institutions, whether it's a media outlet, whether it's a science journal, whether it's a communication um, organization. How does where information comes from reflect credibility. So whether it's the Robert Koch Institute in Germany, for example, giving out statistics, or it's an individual scientist talking about his or her results, why does it matter who is reporting and how the science is communicated and put out there? Who wants to start? Shall I start? I mean, I don't know if I have a good answer to this, but I think, you know, in general, and perhaps the survey data will, will support that, I don't know, um, if it's an institution reporting, it probably regarded as more objective and less biased than if it is an individual. And we've talked about individual scientists all having their own biases, hobby horses, beliefs, and so on. And that's very difficult to... This is where, you know, sometimes you get all these different scientists interpreting results in totally different ways. Um, me, as an individual, I'd probably give you a very different story than maybe Richard Horton would, or, you know, that's true too, with my interests and my background. But, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer other than reflecting like this on this. It is really difficult. I mean, we have some, some numbers about trust in scientists, and those are quite high. Uh, this is quite high trust. And we have uh, numbers about trust in science in general, but we do not have numbers, as far as I can see, and looking at Ricarda, for trust in, 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 in research organizations, for example. I mean, we see that trust in scientists working in universities is much higher than trust in scientists working in, uh, in companies, for example. But uh, that's another, another question. So I think that would be interesting to maybe have a deeper look on, on this one. And the, uh, one more comment, maybe. I mean, this is all changing at the moment, especially among the young people. I mean, if you're looking at the media landscape, who is trusted, which are trusted organizations in the media landscape? Uh, so looking at YouTube, for example, a single YouTuber, is he trusted or not trusted? On, is now he's more uh, trusted more because he's work, working for Funk, which is, which is when uh, <laughs> uh, ZDF or uh, public, the, broadcasting, public yeah. broadcasting, yeah. So, and this is interesting how this changes at the moment. Mm. That's true. I mean, I, if I can add, I, I think it's it's. <sighs> 
it's very complex, you know, and an individual can be can be trusted. I think Rizzo was trusted before he he worked for public broadcasting, and I think an institution can also have a problem with trust because you know a uni single university might might push forward certain results, certain papers, certain persons because they want you know visibility, they want money. I mean, we all know also institutions are also fighting for for resources. So um, I think I, I said it at the beginning, it makes me suspicious if an, you know, if an institution you know like pushes forward a certain topic you know and uh, but uh, i would like to add one more thing that relates a little bit more to your former question i mean the wissenschaftsrat just came out with uh, recommendations on on science communication and i think one one point that i i really liked was uh, the role also of scientists as you know socially responsible and uh, foreseeing public debates you know like and 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 then like reflecting, you know, the, putting their work into the societal context. And I, I mean, I just was in the session before here with Claire Gray, who is a you know, famous battery researcher, and I was really impressed how she not only said, oh, we need elements such and such to be replaced by elements such and such to make better batteries, but, you know, she put it in the, in the general context also of what society needs and and how we can go forward with uh, with electrifying uh, the whole system and that was very impressive and that's the kind of scientist you know like that uh, that I'm looking for we need more of those <laughs> we need more of those okay exactly. let me open up to the audience so if you have a question there's a microphone right there i would ask you just to go up and ask the question so that because this is being live streamed otherwise the rest of the world can't hear you Yes, please go ahead. So I trust science. I know that scientists don't always get it right. Sometimes they make honest mistakes. Sometimes they tweak data. Sometimes fraud is involved. But there is a correction mechanism, because as soon as a scientist publishes something interesting, others will co correct. They, they will check that they are, the facts are correct. So I assume that we all sort of trust science because of this correction mechanism. However, there is a large proportion of people out there who simply do not trust science at all. Rather, they uh, trust their own intuition and they spread around all kinds of strange messages on social media. They don't read The Lancet. I, I don't think they read articles from well-qualified scientific journalists either. So the question is, how do we reach out to those? How do we convince them to trust science rather than to spread, spread false messages? Thank you. Who wants to start? Well, I, I can maybe start <laughs> to, 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 to this. I mean, looking at, at the surveys, which m maybe do not show the whole picture. I mean, if we look at the surveys, we, sh we see that there are around 10% skeptics. And so maybe there are some, some other people who are, are vulnerable to, to those uh, uh, fake news and uh, stuff like that. We see that 30 to 40% are undecided. And I think that we should look on, on these 30 to 40% undecided. We should not, say, waste our time and our scarce resources on the 10% who are really hardcore skeptics. But that's my opinion. So first look at these undecided people. And there are a lot of groups who are interested in science, uh, who we do not reach with our formats at the moment. We should maybe look for other formats for yeah, going to where they are and not uh, waiting till they come to us. So there are different ways to, to engage them. I totally agree. I mean, I think we also give too much <laughs> um, presence and too much uh, aufmerksamkeit. Um, uh, attention. attention. <laughs> Thank you. Attention to these to to this very small minority, but that's very loud on the web. You know, and and, and sometimes I I feel that we you know like we we yeah we give them too much attention, and we should, as Marco said, uh, get get those sort of that, that are not cray, cry, uh, shouting who are, I believe in science, but you know, uh, maybe a little skeptical. And I think through, I would always argue, science has to communicate 
more, and I see ourselves also in, in, you know, in charge as science journalists, uh, how science works, and that science is built on skepticism. You always, you know, like, always ask, you know, is this right? Do I have the right interpretation? I mean, uh, skepticism is something like the mother of science, yeah? And you, and, and talk more as scientists about, about the way you work and, you know, why you ask certain questions and why you uh, dismiss certain questions and how the whole process works. So I think this will eventually, it's, it's a hard, I think it's hard work, yeah? But it will, from my understanding, eventually increase the trust in science. Sabina, do you want to comment as well? Well, then, since I don't read The Lancet, I probably don't need to answer that question. <laughs> but um, joking aside, I think, you know, it is important, and we really rely here on the science journalists a lot, you know, to persuade these 30 to 40 percent that are persuadable, I think. You know, if you, t if you think about vaccine hesitancy, unfortunately, I'm sure you two wouldn't do that, but unfortunately, I still see that covered a lot in, in the journals, in the newspapers, not journals, in the newspapers, you know, in, or in, under the guise of, oh, we need to give both sides the word, and I don't think that's correct in this instance. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Did somebody else have a question? Yes, please, go ahead. Um, my name is Leslie evans Ogden. I'm a science journalist here from Canada, uh, thanks to the Falling Walls Foundation. Um, my question to you is, um, I think it was Sabina that mentioned uh, the idea that we need more process stories so that people understand how science works better. But as a freelance science journalist, those are the stories that are really hard to pitch an editor. So how do we square that? Jean, do we want to start Call with you? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm also a radio journalist. I know I'm the, I, radio and TV. And I mean, these are the stories that don't work as well, of course. It's much better to have the headline, you know, a new, or to have a story about a new, a new cure for, against cancer and to, to do the story about, you know, how hard it is to find a new cure against cancer. No, but um, to be honest, I mean, we try, we try to sometimes do those stories. We don't do them enough. I'm, I perfectly I agree with you and uh, uh, we, have to, we have to do more of those and uh, yeah. That's all I can say. OK, any other comments? I mean, we have to bring it in. Uh, we, we need to uh, try to bring it in uh, every single form at, at Wissenschaft im Dialog. So I mean, it's, it's hard, and it's sometimes not selling very good <laughs> at first place. But you can so, so, so somehow bring it in somewhere. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. Yeah. one more question. Johannes, wait, I'll come to you. <coughs> Hold on. Oops, now I'm getting untangled. Yeah, Johannes Vogel, uh, Museum für Naturkunde Berlin. I am um, a bit struck here that um, after one of the most successful science campaigns, um, still about 50% of people, so 10% are anti science, 30 to 40% on the fence, um, we are celebrating the great success that we've achieved. Um, I think uh, we are not even scratching the surface of the challenge we are on. And what we hear is here, scientists need to communicate more. No, science needs to listen more. We want to push the job to the journalists. Um, so we are playing the old games instead of looking at what is happening in the world. So, for example, we have 500,000 scientists working here in Germany. What are they doing to talk to their contacts, to talk to their neighborhoods, to talk to their communities? We have Sci uh, Fridays for Future, hundreds of thousands of young people who really believe in the power of science. Where do we connect with them? What I hear here is we need a new website, we need to communicate more. Who cares about whether we communicate or not? Um, and um, so we are peddling the old ways and think that the challenges are going to go away. I think we really need to reflect very deeply what we can do to change the way how we as scientists feel, how we enact with the public, and then perhaps we get some resonance and then perhaps the numbers might change, but not the way how it has been done thus far, sorry to say. 
Thank you. That's actually a perfect sort of last question to end this discussion on. So we've been talking about trust in science, which means the public trust in science. Does science trust the public? Let's stop with that panel. Do you want us to answer that? Does science trust the public? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Johannes Vogler is right. I mean, there's, uh, scientists need to think more about how they they uh, they communicate with society, and and uh, of course they need journalists, but they also they also need to to connect to to uh, societal groups, and uh, yeah, why not team up with Friday for Future? Uh, and like climate scientists, I, I don't see much of that action either. So I, I agree, there's several ways of connecting to the public and, uh, and we should try them all. <coughs> well, maybe Johannes, you didn't listen to my moment, sorry, but to say it. I, I think communication for me means listening as well, not only talking to the public. So I, I, if I'm talking about, when I'm talking about communication, I mean, also listening to, to the public, and I include this uh, in, into communication. So, and well, we didn't talk here about well, reputation of science communication in the scientific system. And I mean, yeah, for sure, we, we talked about this a lot of times. Ecole de la from the ministry <laughs> sitting here, and we are we are all on on the on the same uh, on the same um, uh, pitch, uh, place here, so that we we need to um, um, get a better reputation of science communication in the scientific system. System. So that it is a bonus if you do science communication as a scientist and not a malus, which is still still the case in, in, in some fields. So yeah. Yeah. Sabine, anything well, to add? I, I would love all scientists to become advocates. You know, I think that would be great uh, if we could achieve that. How to achieve that is the million dollar question. Um, and I think part of the problem is also how science is rewarded. You know, in institutions and career progression and grant applications, it still just counts how many papers you've published in high impact journals, how much money you have, you know. But nobody talks in a very deep and serious way about impact, your research, what impact did it have on society. I think that would be a start if we could make that as part of the academic reward systems in institutions. And in my capacity as World Research Integrity Conference person, I am actually fighting for, for that. But this is a long road. Thank you. So let me thank Sabine Kleinert, Markus Weiskopf, Jean Rubner for a wonderful discussion. Let me thank all of you for attending and discussing this with us. And thank you to Falling Walls for giving us this platform. Bye-bye. <laughs>